Paris based correspondence one hour and with us is Anne Bagamary. How are you from the Very International well. Tribune? Nice to be here. Also with us, Craig Capitas, reporter and author of books that include Mona Lisa's pajamas. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. All right. Anthony Belanger is the man uh, responsible for what you see in the television show Le Blogueur on the Franco German television channel Arte. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank and you uh, Alberto me. Romagnoli, the Paris correspondent for Italian public broadcaster. Rai, thank you for being thank with you. us. Um, the World This Week, which you can always follow on Facebook and uh, throughout the week. And also on Twitter, our handle at Francois F24. In this country, one month to go. On Sunday, May the 6th, Nicolas Sarkozy stands for re-election in the second round of the presidential election. He's rebounded from record low popularity ratings, what Americans sometimes call Nixon numbers, and has now narrowed the gap with socialist frontrunner François Hollande to uh, somewhere in the region of six or eight points in the second round, depending on which polling institute you swear by. Again, that's the second round. Uh, the first round uh, in just over two weeks. Now there's another number that everyone is watching, the turnout rate. Last time around in 2007, a whopping 85% of the French voted in the first round. This time, there could be a record abstention. Anthony Benanger, the French politics crazy. <laughs> Why does it look like so many might vote with their feet? Because there is no patience about about that election. I mean, everything's. Everybody knows that they are going to to take tough de de decision. Either Sarkozy or Holland, because, or Holland. I mean, the the two contenders, main contenders, when they will arrive or when they will be elected. So there is no. They cannot. They cannot promise a, a lot of things. They just can go on with the election. Just. To, and go on with their own arguments. But th there is no passion. I do remember that in 2007, for example, with uh, when Ségolène Royal and Nicolas Sarkozy were the main uh, contenders, well, the passion was here. Everybody was waiting for their next, uh, their next uh, discourse or their next uh, speech. And no, I'm, I don't even know what would be the next um, speech of Mr. Holland or Mr. Of Mr. Sarkozy. <laughs> there is not such a passion. That's the first clue, I think. Why, why is the passion missing, Anne Wagner? I think, well, first of all, I think probably the socialists spent all their passion in the primaries. Um, there was passion there. There was some real choice. There were some fiery speeches. There were fireworks. And there were some real options presented to the socialist um, voters. Who so you're saying there's no option between Nicolas Sarkozy oh. and his main rival? No, no, there's definitely an option. It's just that it's all too well known by now. Sarkozy has been president for five years. Everyone knows where he stands. He is basically running on the record of the last five years with a few little right-wing twists to respond to Marine Le Pen, especially in social issues. Mm -hmm. um, Hollande has presented his economic platform. It's pretty classically socialist. Uh, it's what the socialist electors wanted. That's why they put him forward. And I think there's just no real surprises about either where these men stand or whether they will get into the second round. Uh, I, I think that the tendency might have been for there to be a protest vote, uh, do better guys. You know, we, there are some, there's a left candidate, there's a right candidate, there's Marine Le Pen, and there's uh, Mr. Mélenchon. They could, they could have attracted a fair number of voters, but People just don't see that in this process it's going to do any good. Uh, there's also a calendar issue that's been uh, brought up by some, and some have even turned this into a conspiracy theory. That is to say, the first round takes place during the Easter vacation. You know the French, Alberto Romagnoli, they like their vacation. The Easter vacation, first round. Second round takes place over the long bank holiday weekend for May the 8th. Uh, do you believe in conspiracy theories? <laughs> no, I, I uh, was in Toulouse and somebody was saying that there was a conspiracy theory over there too. Uh, I think that there is a problem of uh, politics all over the world. Uh, in my country, we have a so-called technical government. Mm -hmm. So the politician mm -hmm. is out of the game mm -hmm. for a while, for one year, until next year. And uh, so-called uh, technicians are doing the job. I, I'm sure that they are doing a political job, but anyway, they're not the traditional right or left. And I think that even uh, Sarkozy is trying to offer something that is not right or left. He's, he's saying all the times I'm uh, talking with the, to the people directly, uh, forget uh, the, which is my party. Or I, I tell you the real problems, and even Hollande is trying to say I'm normal. They they're trying to forget their story, because I think there is a problem of 
politics all over the world. Mm. All right, now, uh, Anne Begumer is saying the Hollande campaign failing to stir passion. Financial Times didn't see it that way on Thursday. Uh, they made the front page out of the fact that uh, there he is, extending open arms to the socialist 2007 candidate, Ségolène Royal, who happens to be the mother of his four children and who ran against him for the nomination <laughs> Uh, this time around. Uh, so, uh, there Craig Capito. There's no suspense at all. I mean, it's, it's the only image, a little bit glamour, that you can, you can take of that campaign. There is two good reasons to that. First, you know, French and French people is supposed to be a political country, a political people. So if you don't give them a little bit of politics, you don't give them passion at all. And the second reason is that everybody knows who's going to win. You can, you can say, I mean, if you look at the polls steadily, they're saying that Hollande is going to win the, at the second round. And if you compare them to the 2007 polls, you get exactly the same kind of results. Everybody knew at that period of time that uh, Sarkozy was, go was going to win because every each poll was predicting his victory as every each poll is, pre is predicting the, the, the Holland victory. So there is no suspense, no glamour, <laughs> no politics in it. Is it game over? It's a no kind of base. Yeah. Look, the Socialist Party screwed the pooch on this from the very beginning. <laughs> Let's take a real quick history. So you're lesson. saying the opposite. You're saying that uh, Sarkozy will win. Oh, yeah. Come on. I mean, it's as inevitable as Romney being the Republican candidate. Uh, save the confetti. Look, Sarkozy, like him or not, broke the mold because he was the first president of this country who did not come from the French Imperium. And then he didn't now, like it. Well, that the was French more like a question it. of personality than it was of policy, and fair enough. So what do the socialists do in this great country of France, which is a great country, which has some of the smartest people in the world? Who do the socialists go and pick Sigalon Royale's boyfriend, who <laughs> comes out of the Imperium, who is essentially a college professor, he has never been a minister. You're right. He's a little bit dull. And, yeah. well, and it's not even dull. I wouldn't trust this guy walking my cat to the litter <laughs> box. Now, Sarkozy, yes. Does he grate on people? Yes. Has he, has he failed to follow through with policies? His new 30-point policy statement is precisely the same one he gave last time. But the fact remains that within on a global stage... France can trust Sarkozy. And I just so, think I just think Hollande, the, the socialist, lost memory. the opportunity. It's because you've got a short memory. Because it, it, we were saying exactly <laughs> the, the inverse. I mean, the, the contrary. When Sarkozy was elected, when Sarkozy was elected, he had no international well, see, experience. No, I, I no, 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 but I, I, dis I disagree with you he, he on that point. You could make point. the difference between right, a, so he, an American he, he, president. Been, it's it's not. Listen, it's not a question of Sarkozy. If the Socialist Party of this country, if the best they can come up with is Francois Hollande, it's, then it's, there's a real dysfunction within the Socialist Party. All right, we'll see no, how that, we'll see how that plays out. There is. It's a second choice. Don't remember, you, you have to, to remember that Dominique Strauss-Kahn was the first choice of the I'm, Socialist Party. And it would have been, yes, I know, <laughs> I know. All right, wow. But, the, <laughs> that, uh, but it was the second choice. was then, uh, this is now, and what's interesting, you were mentioning Toulouse, the kingmaker in this campaign, might not be the far right, but a former socialist, now mm. running with the backing of the French Communist Party, tens of thousands turning out on Thursday in the southwestern city of Toulouse to see and hear Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a man who brands himself the sound and fury after the William Faulkner novel. Uh, Alberto Romagnoli, what do you think of this phenomenon? That, um, as I was saying, he still uh, gives the idea of a dream. Then uh, everybody is, is thinking that it's an impossible dream to change the system. But I think that uh, a lot of people all over the world and a lot of in France still think that politics can change their life. Not, it's not only a matter of technical problems. So he's offering this model and everybody knows that is. So could he bring some of those uh, people who might have stayed away from the polls to vote? Yeah, yes, of course. And, and, uh, and also mm -hmm. some it's people that think uh, that Hollande is not uh, so different from Sarkozy, that he's an old-style politician. So maybe he can push some young people to the poll. And that is, is not you, bad, I think. If you, add the the numbers, if you add the numbers, I mean, the left never has been has, uh, that high since 1980, um, 1981 but and 1988. 
the two last presidential election, the left, the left won. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a good news for the left. Right, of but course. the president is rising in the polls. Uh, his rise, uh, he's getting a big bump since the handling of that siege in Toulouse that resulted in the killing of a homegrown jihadist who targeted French soldiers in a Jewish school. This past Wednesday, an, un an unrelated case, completely unrelated, police arrest 10 more Islamist radicals in several French cities. Another sting operation, it's the second, after the deport, and also there's been deportation orders announced for hardline imams. Cynics argue, uh, can Sarkozy arrest Islamists every day between now and election day? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good yeah, question. If you want to think about a conspiracy theory, think about that. This is a man who controls the security services and, and is making a show of force at a time when pretty much only he can. I mean, But he is getting that bump in the polls. Well, you know, good for him. Okay, he's playing it well, I guess. This probably all needed to be done. But I, I do tend to agree that I think, I think Sarkozy wins this time. And I think it's only partly because he has the opportunity to look presidential at every turn, and Hollande doesn't. I mean, Sarkozy can run a rose garden campaign, as you would say, doing nothing but ceremonial and presidential things. And I think he would still win, because I think probably the French, deep down, are not willing to change horses. All right, Economically, another, politically, they're not willing to change horses. Still got that six to eight points to make up, but another vote there for, a, or at least a prediction there. That's for a prediction. A, a prediction, not a vote. It's, it's, for, it's, a, it's a secret ballot in this country, right? It is, yeah. it is. Okay. Is that what they told you? <laughs> Let's take a bet. <laughs> All right, speaking of a jihadist threat, and this is, a, I guess you could no. say, a more somber story. For the past two weeks, uh, we've been reporting on how northern rebels in Mali have capitalized on confusion in the capital after a coup there to siege, to seize a uh, vast desert territory that's larger than France. Regional powers and Western backers uh, busy pressuring the very junior officers in Bamako to restore democracy, also discovering now how Tuareg rebels, who have uh, this Friday declared an independent state, have in many instances, most notably in Timbuktu, been outflanked by Islamists, allied with an Algerian Salafist group called Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Here's what the foreign minister told me yesterday. On the other side, we have uh, Al-Qaeda, a terrorist movement, and we think that uh, uh, its purpose is to occupy the whole country to implement an Islamist uh, regime. And that's why we are fighting against this risk and we are supporting the intention of ECOWAS to deploy on the ground uh, its force uh, to, to stop uh, the attacks of the terrorists. Uh, supporting, but uh, the minister very clear, not putting boots on the ground. That, as you're telling us, he would not. That would not go down well. Wouldn't go down well with the Malians. Wouldn't go down well with neighboring Algeria. So uh, it is not that clear. It, it, it is an Islamic um, um, alliance because I mean you've got separate, uh, uh, let's say, movements there. The, the main one, which is called the MNLA, is not Islamist at all. It's just an old-fashioned nationalist movement who wants is part of the of the cake. And the part of the cake is the two-third part of, of Mali, which is a huge region, a huge country, the double size of France or something like that. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the Tuareg Nationalist Rebellion. And then they lied themselves, or they let two other groups, as you said, um, Islamic groups, let's say, uh, helping them to conquer and to, um, that, that, that region. So when Mr. Juppé says that there is an Islamic danger, I think that there, is, there are more, um, let's say, uh, a battle within the, the, the three movements than, than an Islamic danger uh, at, at, um, at, um, at, at first. And the, the, very th the, the, the very important thing you've got to know is that, for example, the main Islamic group, which is called Ansar Din, it's something like, it's no more than 200 up to 300 soldiers or militants. They can do whatever they want because there is nobody there. There is no more uh, a state, no more uh, soldiers, no more Malian army. But anyway, they're still, it's still not no more than, to, than two or three hundred people. All right, and back in Bamako, a sense of dread for all those fleeing the north and the fighting. First of all, I'm scared. Already food is scarce. I'm scared because we don't know what is going on. Telephone lines are cut. They say we have to follow Islamic laws. It's mandatory. Al-Qaeda is there, the officials from Akim are there. And by Gamuri, uh, when it was a coup and uh, democracy, which had been there for two decades, yes. uh, had uh, been uh, suspended, um, there was attention given. And now that we're saying the word Islamist again, 
uh, suddenly the West is paying, it seems, much more attention. I think justifiably because, I mean, the real danger and um, our correspondent, our, the correspondent for the New York Times and the IHT in uh, West Africa, Adam Nasseter, um, his, his firm belief in this is not that the danger is so much a, a small African conflagration, uh, there's some resources at stake, but yeah. that uh, one needs to regard this question. His, his great fear is that this is Pakistan waiting to happen. Mm. This is a state that will do nothing but turn out terrorists to come and make trouble for the Anne's, rest of us. And, <clears throat> you know, Anne, Anne is absolutely correct in that assessment. There, when you look at um, uprisings like this, presidents who can't keep their troops in the barracks, I always look for a statistic, a number, the one number that tells you all you need to know. And I um, checked with the World Health Organization today, mm -hmm. and I discovered that 91.6% of the women in Mali have undergone genital mutilation. Yes. Oh, okay, well, I think that's really all you need to know about the radical Islamists who want to take control here, and all you need to know need to know about this, you know, the darling President Touré, who is the darling of the aid agencies but, uh, for the past Hang on, Craig well. Peterson. I, I've been several times to Bamako. The people there are not hardlinisms. They're just devout Muslims. And yes, they do practice uh, genital mut mutilation. We're talking about something different. We're talking about something where uh, there's a sense of a vast sway of territory that's become lawless, uh, yes. with or without some support from inside well, of yes, Algeria. But, but when you're looking at genital mutilation of women on that scale, what you're seeing underpinning that is there is a, a very fundamental well, fair, Muslimist underpinning. To be fair, no, 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 no. I, to be I, fair, it's, I mean, no. no, no. I think, in, I think, I mean, think in 2012, fair, when other trying countries to deal in Africa, with Africa, and even in Africa, Egypt, you, where you've you, got that kind it's, of genital it's, mutilations. It, and it's, it's, it's not a significant a, statistic, right, which well, I didn't speak It's volumes. not linked to Islam. We'll agree to disagree. And it has never been. We'll agree to disagree. We're going to have to take a break. When we come back, uh, the world this week will resume. And uh, we'll give the verdict on the verdict, that uh, 25 years uh, sentence given to the man dubbed the merchant of death, Victor Booth. Mm -hmm.